evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Donna Griffith, and I am a corporate storyteller, which basically means that for the past 13 years, I've roamed the world helping people not be boring. It's a great job. You, know, you take figures, facts, data, bits and bytes, all the, who in here is an engineer? Yeah, all you guys. And, 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 and make it captivating for the audience to listen to, actually let them understand it and drive them towards the results that you want. Um, I started working with Enterprise and then since about 2008 I've been working with startups and investors creating their presentations and in total raising over hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, unfortunately you know I didn't take percentages so I didn't see any of that but the satisfaction when I see a startup I worked with at Seed, raising around C is like, wow, it's, it's, it's such a great feeling. So just a word about SVOD. Um, this workshop tonight actually was inspired towards SVOD, and we're actually recording. Hi, everybody out there that will be preparing for SVOD and watching this, because I'm not doing any mentoring this year until you watch this video. Because I mentored a lot of the companies last year, and I kept seeing the same thing happening over and over again. People were just not telling stories. They were getting very detail oriented and I, I, I suggested to Stas and Anna and, and Tatiana, why don't we do a webinar or a workshop for it this year? So that's kind of the timing, how it worked out. How many people in here are entrepreneurs? <laughs> wow, lots, okay. What else are in here not entrepreneurs, like business people? High tech, yeah, okay. Good, so, but it looks like a lot of people have started up. So how many people are actively fundraising? Or, you know, okay, nobody wants to, I mean, we're never, yes, fundraising, we're never not fundraising, right? We're always kind of, sort of, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so just in case you might be fundraising, uh, this workshop tonight is actually gonna be devoted to the quick pitch, which is what you would do if you presented SVOD. You have five minutes up on stage and then you have like a three minute Q&A. It might be a two-minute pitch, like uh, we worked with Kalina and she had two minutes. It might be a one-minute elevator pitch. It might be a networking event that you have that you need to be able to present yourself in a powerful, quick way that people get and want to continue the conversation. So that'll be the focus. Some of the structure you'll pretty much be able to use for a longer investor presentation. Feel free to ask me anything. And when I'm done, uh, we're going to hear from three startups and then maybe spontaneously hear some shorter elevator pitches. Uh, and I'll coach them through it so you can kind of see uh, hands-on how we start transforming stories. So if you were walking down the street in San Francisco and asked somebody, what's a pitch? Most likely, unless you hit on a tech geek, they'd say, oh, baseball, of course. So when you think about a pitch in baseball, the pitcher throws the ball hard, it hits the bat, the batter knocks it out of the park, the audience is on their feet, and that is the kind of response I want from your quick pitch. I want energy, I want the audience alive, I want them listening and engaged and nodding. Another use of pitch is to, tell a, to pitch a tale, to pitch a yarn, to tell a fantastical story. Now when people hear, oh wow, a storyteller, there's different responses. It's kind of become a buzzword, hasn't it, storytelling? Uh, but oftentimes people get confused. I was on a panel of judges for a pitch competition a couple months ago in Santa Clara, and everybody had a two minute pitch. And after like six people had gone and I gave my notes and it needs to have more of a story, this guy gets up and he tells like just some random story and then he goes into his pitch. So when he was finished, I said to him, um, I'm not quite sure how that story tied in. You could have just, or he's like, I thought you would love that I told a story. <laughs> So it's not just about telling a story. A story has a structure. A story has a very fine methodology. If you think back to Chekhov, or to Shakespeare, or Moliere, or the Greek tragedies, there's a certain structure to the stories. Movies, there's about eight scripts that get written again and again and again and again. And we keep going them because there's twists and, and characters and plots and surprises. But it's basically the same thing, and our brain knows how to process those stories. Another thing about stories is that they resonate. It, it sparks sort of a recognition of, oh yeah, that reminds me of the time that. And then people identify with it, people get it, people listen, and every part of our brain starts to get engaged. It's not just the verbal processing center. If I had a bunch of bullets here and I was just reading them off. 
it's more. It's if I start talking to you about how delicious the pizza out there was and the cheese and all the toppings and it was, then your sensory cortex kicks in and you can almost taste the pizza. And so we want to get people as involved as possible. And another beautiful thing about stories is we actually can sync our brains with our audience. When we tell a story, that's how powerful it is. And that's when influence starts to kick in because we kind of have them captive and then we can actually get ask for what we want if we do it right. So I always tell people that a first investor meeting is like a first date. Anybody in here still single? Raise your hands, okay. Oh, see, okay, if anybody, you know, mark them. So a li little bit of dating advice. On the way, it's also pitching advice. If on your first date, you start talking about your entire dating history and how you plan to raise kids and where you'd like to get married, there's a good chance you're not gonna have a second date with that person, okay? I'm just saying, you can thank me later. Same thing with an investor. If you lay everything out the first and you bring your entire tech plan and your P&L and all the numbers, there's a good chance you're not gonna have another meeting because they already know everything. You wanna leave some mystique. You wanna leave them asking where you want a second date. You want them to ask you to send them things. Now, with a five minute pitch, it's even worse. It's like speed dating. Anybody ever done that? Of course, no one's gonna admit it. I did about 12 years ago when I was single and living in New York. It's like speed dating, that sounds like a very efficient way to meet people. I'm, I'm all about efficiency. So 10 people at once, something good's gotta come out of there. So you basically, you're at a bar, there's 10 tables, the women sit at the tables, the men circle around, and you have five minutes to talk to the person and decide if you ever wanna see them again. Five minutes can be a very, very long time, let me tell you, <laughs> okay? So I don't want people listening to your pitch looking like her. I want people listening to your pitch going, oh my gosh, that's been five minutes. I, I just want to hear more. I can't wait to meet this person. I want to take them out to dinner. So yeah, no. so keep that alive. Now there's no way that in five minutes, two minutes, no way that you're going to tell the entire story of your startup. It's not going to happen. It's about opening their minds, it's about intriguing them, it's about getting them to want to hear more. And then continuing the conversation, especially if you have Q&A, there's obviously going to be some questions that they're going to ask you. We'll talk about how to prep for that because that is just as important as we saw last year at SVOD. So, what does need to be there? Well, first of all, you want to introduce yourself and your company name. That might sound trivial, but you wouldn't believe how many pitches I coach that the people just simply don't introduce themselves. So, so your name, your company name, and your position, and then I want you to give like a vision statement. What do I mean by that? It, it's not starting to go, a lot of times people will start telling what their product is at the very beginning and we haven't even gotten into it yet. We don't know why you're here. And it's confusing, we don't hear it. So stick to something simple and powerful. So for example, um, we have a company called Invisu which you all can try out. It's actually a wizard that guides you through creating your send out deck. But if I were starting and I was giving my vision statement, I would say, hi, I'm Donna from Invisu, and we're creating a smarter investment process. <coughs> I haven't said much. What does that mean? Oh, there's smart, there's investment, there's enough for people to start thinking about it. So go for your bigger vision. Now, if you have any major traction or you've won any awards or you've just closed a big round, you can actually start with that, just briefly, because then it kind of gives you a credibility. Now there's three things we're constantly driving for in a pitch. Credibility, likability, and momentum. Credibility, you've got the chops, your team have got the chops, you know your industry, you know how to get this done. Likeability, it's all about you. We'll talk about how we can influence that towards the end of, of my speech. And momentum, how far have you gone so far? So those are the three things we constantly want to be answering. Now, unless your team looks like that, <laughs> um, there's no need to start with a team slide, especially in a five minute pitch. Even in an investor pitch, unless you have like serial entrepreneurs with exits under their belts, you don't necessarily have to start with the, the, the team. Again, it's about credibility. If these are just really hardworking, great guru, ninja, rock stars, then it's okay to talk about them later. Because the first thing we wanna get to is that story is that influential moment. So what is the first thing we talk about after we've introduced ourselves? What do you think? Story. Yeah, well, thank you. But what, what <laughs> good, good guess. What is, what, what did I hear? Problem. 
Something they actually feel and experience. Something they feel and experience, so the problem. The problem, the gap, the need, the challenge. Now, everybody's like, oh yeah, of course, right? How many of you were about to say, the product, of course. I meet tens of startups each week, and the majority, when I sit down with them, will start telling me about the product. I was working with someone in Israel last night from 9 to 11, nightmare, long hours, long days, but he, we were working on his email that, to send out to investors, and he's working on something that's a totally new kind of field that, you know, if you do DevOps or you work with something for merchants or for marketers that not everybody knows, you kind of got to get them in and understanding what it is that you're working on, open a window for them. So you want to start off with the problem statement. And the best way to tell about the problem is through a story. So you either want to make them feel the pain <coughs> or make them go, hallelujah, I can't believe you're about to solve this, this is amazing, I never even realized how much I wanted it until you just brought it up. It's one of those. People are motivated either by wanting to protect themselves from something bad happening to them or move towards something good happening to them. The carrot or the stick. You just decide which is the bigger motivator in whatever it is that you're working on. Now the story, usually the best story is your personal story. As a founder, something happened to you or to someone you care about or to the world at large that you couldn't sit quietly by anymore. You needed to go out and make a change and quit your job and go on this crazy ride and, and start this startup. So tell the story of that moment. Now the good news is that Mark Twain said, never get the, let the truth get in the way of a good story. So I'm not saying lie about it, I'm not saying make up the story, I am saying take the story and give it some polish. Cut away the excess parts, nobody's going to check what happened on which day and exactly anything that's not necessary, you know, cut it down to that because you want people nodding and going, oh my gosh, I don't, wouldn't want that to happen to me or, oh wow, that would be really cool if that happened to me. And this out of a five minute pitch is probably going to be 30 to 50 seconds closer to the 30 seconds if we're breaking it down time-wise. Just enough for them to say, okay, so how are you going to solve it? Now, when we talk about the problem, we call it the villain, bad guy in a movie, because an action-adventure movie without a good villain is just a sappy drama. The first two minutes you meet the villain, and that keeps us on the edge of our seat. And that's what we want with your, with your story. So there's a bunch of different, I'm going to send these slides out afterwards, uh, and Ten will make sure you get them. So everything from bad economy, what, what kind of new type of companies have emerged because there's been a bad economy for the past eight years? Countless numbers. So, patients at what? Countless numbers. Countless numbers. Well, what, like sharing economy? Yeah, that didn't exist eight years ago. Can you imagine eight years ago having somebody pull up in their own car and say, get in, would you like a ride? Mm -hmm. I was like, what? But today Uber, we don't think twice about getting into somebody's personal car. So it's all a question of circumstance. Boredom is a huge villain. And the proof of that is King just was acquired for $5.9 billion. And you know what King makes? Candy Crush. People are freaking bored and they need things to fill their time and they need to constantly be doing it and, and constantly have new games. Um, a popularizing cultural trend. Something new is happening. Like let's say live broadcast video. Meerkat, Periscope, Facebook's now got a live thing. It's, it's very trendy so what about businesses and what about politicians and getting on that? You need to make them see if they're missing out on this. So there's all kinds of different villains we can find. It's just a question about how to get the, the sexiest story going. Questions? All right, so once we have our villain story in place, then you can give a simple description of your product. And when I say simple, I mean simple. We do X for Y by Z. Not a lot of vloggia and zatsyas and, and all kinds of like uh, technologies. It's something super simple that everyone sitting in the room gets what you do. You can also use Adeo Resi um, has a startup Madlib, which he says, my company blank is developing a blank offering to help a blank audience blank a problem with a blank secret sauce. So you can fill that out and that kind of becomes your one, and that's going to be a very useful one-liner for you. 
You're going to use that at other points, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Being able to explain your startup in one line is an art form. And you're going to try different ways until you find the one that makes people's eyes lit up and they get it right away. So the simple description, and as quickly as possible, you want to get to an impressive demo. Steve Jobs could have stood around for an hour talking to us about the iPad or just show it. <coughs> What's the stronger effect? Of course the showing. We're visual creatures. The biggest part of our brain is the visual processing center. So we need to see it to believe it. We need to, 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 to grasp it. So show a demo. It can be a film. It can be a film you made yourself using Camtasia, which is a screen recording software, or iMovies if you have a Mac. Um, you can do screenshots. You could do wireframes. You can just do a mock-up, but something that shows them what it is that you're doing. And as you're showing, you can tell. You can show off like three or four major features. Walk them through it as if it's a first-time user perspective. And in your five-minute pitch, this should be maximum a minute. Maximum a minute. But it is kind of the star. This is the, 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 the real epicenter of everything. That's what they're here for, to hear about your product. Then you want to talk about how far along you are. Are you in beta? Are you in production already? Do you have customers? Do you have revenue? Is it just an idea? Which is, you know, okay, the idea on the napkin, you might get funded, you might get some preliminary funding just to get the idea off the ground. But they just want to know where you are, not where you're going to be, where you are right now. And then we want to talk about the business. So if we look at our presentation in chapters, chapter one was the problem, chapter two was the solution and the product, chapter three is the business. So there's really not a lot of time in five minutes to talk about all of your business. So there's three important points I want you to hit on. One, differentiation. What makes you st st stand out from your competitors? Now, I hope it's, an, by the way, I just wrote a blog about this that was released two days ago. Um, I'll, I'll put it on the Umbar page or, or Tatiana can. It's a really great rundown of how to talk about your competition and it's so important and it's so hard. So uh, you need to know your competition really well. You need to not talk trash about any of your competitors because you have no idea who might be in the room that's an initial investor or board member or involved somehow in, that, in your competitor's startup. Uh, and you want to also leverage the success. So, so you're never saying anything bad about them. So they do ABC. We do ABC plus XYZ. Very confident, very, you know, you know what really is different about you and you're prepared for tough questions with it. Monetization, how are you gonna make money? Now even if you're at that point in your startup where you're growing your community and you're, you're not gonna monetize the first year, even the first two years, you need to show that somewhere down the line you know how you're gonna make money on this and significant money. So is it affiliate, is it subscription, is it ads? What is it? And finally, opportunization. Yes, I know that's not a real word, but it go, rhymes with monetization differentiation, so it's easier to understand. So what do I mean by that? Talking about just the market size, sometimes this is very obvious. We know the smartphone market is huge. We know that the VR is rising. We, but what don't they know? Try to find some interesting trends and opportunities in your market that show that this is a hot opportunity now. Something might have changed in the market. Someone might have gotten acquired. A law might have gone through. Something is happening because investors suffer from a disorder called FOMO, fear of missing out. And if we can touch on that sensitive spot and show them that if they don't invest in you, they might be missing out on the next big thing, that's a good thing. Nobody wants, in this town wants to feel like they've missed out on the next big thing. So really give them a reason to see that this is a hot opportunity and it's timely. So those are the three things you're really going to have time for. The rest of the business stuff, leave for the Q&A. Unless there's something super important about the business that you want to talk about. Then you can talk about the team. But again, it's not a time to go through everybody's resume. Um, you want to give kind of the overview of why this team is the team to get this off the ground. We have a team made up of technology experts, business, marketing, design. People, and you could put the logos at the bottom of places that people have worked. So you show that you have an impressive team. Of course, later they can ask you more about the team. But just to show what you have, what are your assets. 
And then finally, I want you to end with inspiration. You would not believe how many pitches I see that are really great and then they end kind of with a, um, well, uh, well, um, that's it. Okay, thanks. Really? That's all you have for me? You've given a great presentation and that's how you end? No. End as powerfully as you started. So you started with a story. Cap off the story. Tell us where it is now. What's happening with it. End with a powerful quote. End leading us on the journey of where you're headed. But this is just the beginning. We envision ourselves going, different markets, new products, whatever it is, so that they go, wow, this is even bigger than we thought. Inspire. Let them, leave them with a feeling of like, wow, I want to hear more from this person. This is really great. Now, last year at SVOD, I was watching a lot of the pitches that I, that I didn't have the opportunity to coach. And sometimes I'd hear the great story mixed in somewhere, like even in the Q&A. Like there was this one guy and one of the um, judges asked him, so how did you get the idea for this? And then he told this great story. And I'm like, why didn't he start with that? Why didn't he tell that in the presentation? Don't miss those opportunities. Just don't. Because that's what really makes it about you and makes it unique and goes to your likability as well. Questions? Good. So this is, yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the content and the structure of a five minute pitch. Now let's talk about an elevator pitch. There's three different kinds of elevator pitch. There's the actual elevator pitch, which is about the time it would take to go from the bottom floor to the top floor of like the Empire State Building and then back down again, a little over a minute. And if you've gotten the opportunity to present yourself in a minute, the good news, it's the same. So we had four chapters. We had problem, solution, business, and vision for the future moving forward. Same thing only here, we're gonna condense it down. So you can start with your problem story, shave it down, use your simple sentence about your solution, and then give us something amazing about your traction, about the market, something that wows us. That's it. Okay, then there's what I call the handshake pitch. You're in a networking event, you're walking around, talking to people, and they say, so what do you do? You have about 20 seconds to keep their attention with you before they start losing it. And by the way, be aware of the person you're talking to. I've seen so many conversations and I've actually been on the receiving end where you pass and you see an entrepreneur going on and on about something and you see the person standing there kind of like, <laughs> like they really want to go. So let them go if they're not interested or make them interested. So again, quick line about your problem. Now if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, you can turn it into a question. So have you ever... Ba, 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 and don't make it too personal. You can ask them a question, get the problem, get them talking about it, and then talk about the solution. Now, if you have something you can show on your smartphone, great, have it queued up already when you're at a networking event. Have it ready, don't go digging for your demo. Show it, scroll through it, let them see it. Awesome, if they're interested in continuing, it'll be more than 20 seconds. The third type is the eye blink pitch. This is if you're at a conference and all of a sudden you see Mark Zuckerberg walking by and you just have to pitch your startup and you know you have like a one line shot to do it. So find like five or six power statements that, that talk about your, your bottom line, your benefits of how you're going to really, really impact and what you're really going to do and the kind of money you're capable of making and have those in your back pocket. Now the great thing about the elevator pitch is there, it's versatile. It would be different if you're speaking to a potential investor or a potential partner or a potential user. Practice and see what works for, for who. And when you hit on a good one, write it down, share it with your team, keep it evolving. It's, it's a process. Your slides. There is no excuse to have a great looking product and crappy looking slides. Slides are the first thing that they see. It's a reflection of you and of your product and if they look like, you know, just plain old PowerPoint or those little stick figures from, that are built into the PowerPoint, that's not boding well for you. So if you have a designer on team or a UI person, great. Let them work their magic on the slides. If you don't, there's all kinds of like tools that you can use. <coughs> that are free or very inexpensive. Um, Slide Bean is one. Haiku Deck is another. Um, Emaze 
like Amaze, but with an E is another. So these, these companies let you upload your deck and will automatically like make them look visually beautiful and then you can kind of adjust it and cut down the verbiage. Now let's get something straight. Anybody ever feel like this guy wanting to commit suicide? If you've ever worked for a large company, you have. It's horrible. A 60 slide deck filled with bullets and bullets in tiny font and you just want to die or, or like really run away. Presentation does not equal documentation. You cannot use the same deck to present and to send out. Okay, if what I would do, what I usually do with clients is I create the big investor deck and then we choose like five to eight slides off of that and they're very clean and visual slides and then we'll just add some text to it, PDF it and send it out. Or a one pager or use Invisu or something that you know uses words because you're not there to explain it. So the thing is we take in information <clears throat> through three channels. Our visual, our auditory and our kinesthetic. When we read, what part of our brain do you think is accessed? The visual, the auditory or the kinesthetic when we read? Visual? Anyone think otherwise? Depends. Huh? Depends. It might depend, but there's something pretty clear cut. It's not visual. <clears throat> it does go in through our camera, but it gets processed in our language processing center. And we can decode. I think all of us have English. Some of us have Russian. If I looked at Russian letters, I would completely get lost. It would stay visual. I can tell it's Russian, but that, there it stops. Some of us have Hebrew. There's probably another few languages in here. So it takes a little bit longer. It doesn't feel like longer, but when we read, we're not doing it with our eyes, we're doing it with our brains, with the same vessel that hears. So if I had a bunch of language up here, what would you guys do automatically? You'd read. Well, I mean, first you'd try to read it because if it's up there, it must be important. We're all obedient students still in our hearts. So that's the auditory part of your brain. And I'm trying to talk. What would you try to be doing with me? Listen, auditory as well, uh-oh, uh, uh, busy signal. It is nearly <clears throat> impossible to both read and listen at the same time or write and listen unless you're taking notes. Even women, and we're much better multitaskers than men because we kind of have to be, um, this part we fail at as well. So I would not, if you're writing an email and talking on the phone, hit send until you've checked what you've done. So. Don't punish your audience and don't compete with your own words. One big idea per slide is the rule of thumb. I don't care if for a five minute pitch you have 12 slides as long as they're clean and neat and fast. It doesn't matter. Nobody's counting your slides if they're visual and beautiful and, and simple and convey a message. I was at the Startup Grind conference the other day uh, and a lot of people had really great slides. It was just like a visual the whole screen would be a visual and a one-liner. And it was brilliant. It was beautiful. And people laughed. And it completed what they were saying. And then it left our brains open to hear them. Now I want to add something to that. Uh, it's the one big idea that grandma could understand. Or in the words of uh, Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Now where did uh, <clears throat> I get the grandma story? About 12 years ago, I was teaching a workshop at a hardware company in Santa Clara before I was living out here, long before, and to a group of hardware engineers. This was the slide that one of the guys brought up to his presentation. Now, I'm sure all the engineers are sitting here saying, oh, that's clear, I was ready to die. <clears throat> I was also looking around at the other hardware engineers in the room, and they didn't exactly look happy. They looked in various stages of disengagement. And then he got up to present, and this is how he presented. Uh, well, the 10.1 gig B Mac of the SPI 4P2 in the multi gig LAN backbone is interspliced from the net processor into the CSI XL2 switch fabric, which is like basically reading off every single data point. I know some of you are sitting there going, like, oh, I've never done that before, right? Um, so I let him go for a few minutes. And then I stopped him and I said, thank you, that was very nice. By the way, those of you that don't speak American yet, if somebody says to you that was very nice or that was very interesting, they don't really think so. <laughs> they're just very happy that you finally shut up and they're being polite. Um, <clears throat> you, I used to think that if Americans say we'll be in touch, 
uh, it, of course, you're never going to hear from them again. But then I moved to Silicon Valley, and I would hear, awesome, cool, great, amazing. We're so going to be in touch. We're so going to do things. We're so, and then I'd never hear from them again either. I'd be like, wow, this is a whole different level of Americanese here in this town. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyway, back to his story. So I said, okay, thank you. That was nice. Now, can you tell me what that means? And he looked at me kind of like with his, like, duh, like, well, uh, it's so simple. And so he's like, oh, well, what it means is the multi one gig land backbone of the 10 port. Like, going really slowly, then, like, like a child, then maybe I would get it. <laughs> that wasn't working either. So I said, okay, can we try this again? Could you explain it to me so that my grandmother would understand? And he looked at me with like this renewed excitement and faith. He's like, you mean your grandmother's an engineer? <laughs> and he was like ready to hug me. And I'm like, sorry. God rest their souls. Neither of my grandmothers were engineers. I don't know if any of you have grandmas that are engineers. Um, but if you ever tried to talk to your grandparents or even your parents about your startup or, or your, what your, a project you're working on at work, it's different. It's an interesting conversation. I mean, our parents, our grandparents are very smart people. They're just in a different frame of mind. And it's our responsibility to explain it to them in a way that they get. Not theirs. People don't want to feel dumb. They will disengage when they feel dumb. If we can make them feel smart, we have them. So basically, after another few goes, I realized what this guy was trying to say. All he was really trying to say was, Grandma, we're doing a lot more in a lot less space. Grandma, did you know that once upon a time, computers took up entire rooms like this? And today, this little thingy is a supercomputer a bazillion times faster than, than your, those clunky old computers? Kind of like your kitchen grandma, you know, babushka. You cook for 20 people, and, and you have a teeny tiny kitchen. How do you do it? So yeah, so she gets it. So that's what we want. And the bottom line is, it's all about them. <coughs> Rude awakening. It's not about your startup. It's not about your product. It's not about you being featured in TechCrunch and making a lot of money. It's about your audience getting it on the level that you want them to get it at and believing it and wanting to move forward with it. That's what matters. Questions? Okay, another few things on polish and then we'll move on to you guys. So Q&A, hand on your heart. How many people prep for the Q&A the way they prep for the pitch? Okay, very few, and that doesn't surprise me. It's not easy. It's almost just as hard to answer questions, or maybe even harder than to pitch. Because you're on the spot, and people are asking you things, and you're not prepared, and you can't really see what it'll be. So I want you to do some homework. Go home, write out an entire list of all the questions you've ever been asked, all the questions you think you might be asked and all the questions you dread being asked and answer them. Write out answers and familiarize yourself with them. The same way you would review a pitch before you got up, review the answers. You don't have to memorize them, but just know them well enough that you're ready with an answer. And those that you choose not to answer, that's fine too. But you can't say, let's take it offline for everything. Okay? Keep your energy up, be memorable, especially if you're up on a stage. You have to have that energy. So I have a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just not a very dynamic person. I'm not an actor, this is who I am. You know, take it or leave it. <laughs> I'm like, uh -huh, someone's gonna leave it, honey. <laughs> I need you to act like you've either just had 10 shots of espresso or 10 shots of vodka, whatever does it for you. Don't actually go out and do that, please, because we don't need people fainting in the middle of their presentation. But you need to get your energy level up. Now, I was working recently with a CEO uh, who's heading out for a round A. Very accomplished guy, already has an exit under his belt. And when we talked on the phone, he said, it's not, the story's fine, it's me. I've been told I'm not enthusiastic enough, so I want to work on my own style. I said, cool, we met. And it actually, it was the story. It wasn't clear, and he kept repeating himself. He wasn't clear on it, and it was throwing him off. But it, what was worse, somebody had said to him, I guess, along the way, you need to be more enthusiastic. And his way of doing it was, okay, so let me tell you about, and like, kind of like a used car salesman. <laughs> it wasn't working. So I said to him, what gets you excited? And he said, oh, skiing and skiing with my kids. And I said, so tell me about it. And he was like, oh, and I could see the passion. I'm like, okay, go, talk, do your pitch. 
and it just, it was him at his best, at his most energetic and passionate, and that's what we want. Now, you should be excited enough about your product that it's just there. So ride the wave of that ad adrenaline, but keep the passion present. Eyes are the best tool we have to connect with our audience. Oftentimes, presentation skills class will say, find a dot opposite the wall and talk there because then it looks like you're talking to the entire audience. Does it look in any way, shape, or form like I'm talking to you guys right now? <laughs> okay, I didn't think so. And then there's like the sprinkler where they say move your head around just like a sprinkler on a yard would be. <laughs> and that's not quite right either. So let go of those and just make contact. Find someone in the audience. You spend a moment, you spend a thought, got a little smile, a little nod. Move on to someone else and you're sharing the love and the people around kind of feel the, the, the waves of the love as well. And then you can move over and you talk to someone else and you're doing little energy exchanges. You're getting energized, they're getting energized. It feels personal and it's so much better. Even if it's a huge room. It, I mean, this is a, a pretty big room, but well, you know, like an SVOD, it's huge, it's massive, a lot of people. But when you're having a conversation with an individual, it's not as scary as a presentation for a group. So just keep it very personal, keep it very one-on-one, -on -one, and just, I mean, you don't want to spend too long with any one person because that can be a little bit intimidating too if you're looking at just one <laughs> person. They're kind of like, okay, what did I, you know. So presentation equals conversation. If you think about the best presentations you've seen, it'll usually be people that you feel like we're just chatting with you. And that's what we want. What to wear to a presentation? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's not what this is about, just kidding. This is actually about voice. Now, opera singers do not need microphones, and I'm actually doing pretty well. They offered me a microphone in here without it, even though my capacity is not what it usually is for my voice. So I was a little worried there. Um, but w people that know how to train their voice know how to support it with breath. People that don't, oftentimes, does anybody here feel that their voice gets a little bit crackly after about 10 minutes they're talking and you walk away and it's kind of scratchy? Yeah, there you go. So you're probably not breathing enough. And that comes from training either acting or, or singing. You get trained how to breathe. Yoga is another great way. So what I want you guys to do, try it now. Take a breath in through your nose and fill your belly with a tank of air. Okay, I don't have much room in there. But then you have an entire tank of air to talk and it supports your voice and you can keep talking just about till you feel the tank's about to run off but don't keep going past that because then your voice kind of is going like that and even if you have a microphone it sounds like very scraggly. <laughs> so, so before you get there then take a pause. Breathe. Even use that moment pause to re-engage the audience. Oh something changed I have to listen now. And it's all about constantly bringing them back to you whatever technique you can use. <clears throat> So breath is one for volume. The second one is um, clarity. How many people in here is English not their first language? Raise your hand. Okay, so the majority of this room. So if you have to present in English, you're at a disadvantage. You are, because there's certain sounds that exist in English that don't exist in Russian or in Hebrew or in a lot of other languages, and vice versa. So for example, TH. TH doesn't exist in Russian, doesn't exist in Hebrew, so what do we hear? This, that, and the other. <laughs> or this, that, and the other. And it's okay, it's just, it's, it's kind of confusing with certain words what the person's saying. So I want everybody now, I'm giving you a little present, teaching how to say TH. Put the tip of your tongue between your teeth and pull back and go, this. this. Good, that. <laughs> the other. Notice that the tongue must go through. If, it's, if it doesn't, it's hitting and it's going this, that, the other, or this, that, the other. It must come through. There's also the softer TH, the think, where you're kind of pushing think, path, math. And the more you practice that, the more your muscle is strengthened. Same thing with the R. In Russian and in Hebrew, it's the back of the throat, you know, it's very guttural. Um, but in America, it's like everything's like right up here, like, oh my God, round and big. So you want to kind of shut off your throat and rah, rah, rah. You talk with your lips more like that. So those are two big things that if you master, you will be so much clearer. I don't want you to try to get rid of your accent. It's not going to happen. It's part of who you are. It's charming. It's great. I just want you to be understood. Okay? So practice, practice. It's like a gym. Sit in your car, put on like a recording of TH words and just repeat after it. This, that, 
the other, them, those, they. Huge difference. Um, the third part is musicality. Has anybody here never read a book to a child? Raise your hand. Probably all the, the, the single, and that's okay, okay, but you have homework. I'd like you to go borrow a child, preferably with the per parent's permission, okay? Spend a few hours with them reading them books. Why? Because kids are very generous with their feedback. They have no problem telling you that you suck and that you're boring and making clear suggestions on how to get better. So if you've managed to hold their attention for an hour reading them books and get good enough for them to listen, you're probably going to be able to do it in front of an, audi uh, an audience of adults. So you can't read to a kid once upon a time there was a frog that lived in the lake and they, oh, do the voices, do that. No, it's not that I want you to be giving your presentation like this, but we can use that. There's certain words that if we punch, it makes our voice more colorful, like numbers, 50,000 downloads a day, or adjectives. Everybody was amazed by the beautiful UI that they created. Beautiful jumps off. So just, I know it sounds very American, yes, it's funny, but it works. It works. So just certain words give a little oomph to, it'll make your voice sound a lot more colorful. Um, well, uh, like, uh, you know, um, and, um, yeah, so people have a tendency sometimes to have the ums and the ms. I call it the chronic um. It's not just, oh, I've forgotten something, I'm um, trying to remember. No, it's um, somebody who um, every other word um, is like an um, um. And that's very distracting. And there's a very easy way to clean it up. So if you know that you suffer from the chronic um, or you have a team member suffering from the chronic um, here's the exercise. So they're going to present, and you're going to tell them, every time you say um, I'm going to clap. And you just have to be aware and take a breath. Now, the first time you clap, they're going to look at you like, what the heck? I didn't say it. They won't get it. The second time they're going to go like, oh, I said it, didn't I? Third time they're going to like catch it with you. Now they might get very annoyed at you along the way, but that's okay. Better they get annoyed with you than, than you know, not do well in their presentation. And it starts to disappear. It's like magic. Any habit we want to change, we have to be aware of. From biting nails to smoking. You have to be aware that you're doing it. Hands. Uh, We've been together for almost an hour now. You might have noticed that I talk quite a bit with my hands. There are those convinced that if I had my hands tied behind my back, I would be mute. Now, uh, I, I try to make sure that my hands match the message I was saying, because if I was just standing here going like this, what kind of message would I be sending? <laughs> Confused, distracted, what's she doing with her hands? So I'm all frustrated. I'm, I'm all for hand gestures. You can use your wrists, you can use your elbows, you can use your entire frame. I think they're great. But sometimes we also want to rest our hands. So again, b business school will often tell you when you start off, stand like this. This is how a leader stands. Everybody stand up and let's see if we have some leaders in the room. Everybody stand up and do this. Come on, get up off your chairs. Stretch your bones a little bit. Let's see you all go like this. Okay, all right, so we have some leaders. We have some ballerinas, a, a couple accordion players. And a couple of Mr. Smithers. Excellent, yes. So sit down. One size does not fit all. Now, I'm no body language expert. I'm not quite sure that I buy into it. But I see different heights and different widths and different girths in here. Different people looking different. Different gestures look different on you. So I want you to find what works best for you. Some people, this will give them a lot of power. Others will look like a drill sergeant in the army. <laughs> Some people, this will give them authority. Others, it'll make them disappear and be tiny. So you need to find what works best for you. And one more thing about gestures also. I would rather you talk with your hands than talk with your feet. I'll always have a client that's doing kind of little cha-cha while they talk, and they don't even realize that they're constantly doing a little thing as they move. And the whole time they're talking, going like this, and the audience is kind of like, <laughs> um, so until they see a tape of them, so they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I was doing that. So when you're talking, here I don't usually have two screens. Usually it's, it'll be like one screen. So I want to stand with my feet planted, my knees solid at 45 degree angle to my slides. Why? I'm talking to you, but then it's easy for me to glance back occasionally. No, it doesn't mean I have to stay there. I can move. Then I can walk. And I can decide I'm going to walk to the other side of the room. And then I plant myself here and I have a whole new perspective on the room. Another 45 degree angle. 
I just want to make sure never to turn my back to my audience. Then I can choose later to walk to another place and you know move but then I stand and I plant myself so you're either moving with purpose or standing you're not dancing and you're not pacing like you were waiting to hear if your wife has given birth uh, at the delivery room no you the, nowadays you're there with her so talk let the gestures come from your hands not from your feet practice 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 there is not a single profession that requires you to be in front of a, the, the, an audience, not singing, dancing, sports, that there's not a practice or a rehearsal period. And then we write presentations and we walk in after we finish it at three o'clock in the morning, we saunter in at eight to give a meeting and we're like all cool and then it goes horribly and we're like, oh, why did it go so bad? Well, duh. You need to practice it. You need to go through it a few times and it's not just reading it, it's talking it out loud. Either to yourself, do not do it in front of a mirror not a good idea. It's too self-conscious. Either tape yourself, present to a significant other, a friend, a team member. If you're on a plane or a train, make people there listen to your presentation. I don't care until you are totally comfortable with it. It truly helps. Who here gets nervous before big presentations? Okay, so the rest of you either didn't hear me or a bunch of liars because it's the most natural thing in the world to get nervous before a big presentation. If you weren't feeling anything, I'd have to check your pulse. Now, when you get nervous, where in your body do you feel those nerves? Heart, tummy, yeah, so the butterflies in the stomach is probably the most popular one I hear. So put that aside for a second and think of the last time you were really excited about something. A big trip you took, an important meeting, my workshop tonight. Of course, right? Um, so where in your body did you feel the excitement? Same place. Interesting. Butterflies in the stomach for nerves and for excitement. Yep. Same exact thing. So where's the difference? Here. It's the difference between, okay, what's going on? I'm feeling butterflies in my stomach. Oh, I'm about to give a speech in front of 300 people. <gasps> oh my God, I'm so nervous. And those sneaky butterflies, they hear you and they kind of go, Rrr, and they turn black and they grow fangs and they start flying up and fluttering and choking you and you can't breathe and your mouth is going dry and your palms are sweating and you can't remember a thing. It's just not going well. As opposed to, okay, what's going on? I feel butterflies in my stomach. Oh, I'm about to speak in front of 300 people. Woohoo! Yeah! This is exciting! Woo! And those butterflies hear it and they're like, hmm. And they turn colors and they start popping uh, vodka and dancing and doing uh, all kinds of fun things and partying. And then they fly up and they take you with them because these butterflies are our best friend. They are the adrenaline. They're the passion that we need to keep our energy up if we embrace them and let them fly. And then fear becomes face everything and recover. How many times have you prepared for something and you've been like dreading it, oh my God, it's gonna be terrible, and then it actually went really well. People were applauding and coming up and shaking your hand and taking your card and you just were floating. Most likely, that's gonna happen again. So I want you to kind of come in with that feeling and that purpose. And that leads to our last point of the evening, walk in the room at your best. They don't know that you slept two hours last night because you had a big bug in your system. They don't know that you had a big fight with your partner right before you came. They don't know that you sat for uh, an hour and a half in traffic on the 101. All they know is the person that walks in the room or on the stage is who you are. And they have decided right away if they like you or not and if they want to do business with you or not. That's the likability factor. So you need to leave all the crap outside. And from the minute you park your car or get off the Uber or the bike, you are at your best and most charming. You never know who's in the elevator with you. You never know who's online for coffee with you. You never know who's milling around. So you really have to be at your best at all times because there is no second chance for a first impression. Anybody here ever interviewed people for a position? Would it be safe to say then like the first 30 seconds you knew if this person had a chance in hell of moving on or not? Okay, so probably even seven seconds, and then just the rest of it was going through the motions. You've either decided, yes, I want to see them again, or no, no way. Same thing with dating, if we go back to dating, right? I, I, went, I dated a guy one time, and then we became friends, and he, so he had the seven-second rule. Like, he'd go on a blind date. If, he'd tell the girl in advance, if after seven seconds, one of us doesn't like, we can leave. And then the girls were, like, shocked where he'd want to leave. 
that I was like, that's so brutal. That's so mean. But just think of all this time and money he saved himself um, <laughs> along the way. So there's something to be said for it. So really come in strong and come in at your best. Questions about anything we've covered? Yes, Ashby. About the personal story? Mm -hmm. so should it be a personal story about you or something about them? Like, remember the time when you must have gone to, through X or... I went through X and this it could work either way. It very much depends on the kind of story and the kind of audience. Some things will just work. But, you know, you guys remember because it's kind of a universal thing. Sometimes it'll be like nobody in the audience responds and then you kind of miss that. So it could be you. It could be a story about somebody. Um, it's very good for like if, if you're doing a DevOps or a, a marketing or something. Tell a story of a customer of yours or of, uh, like, you know, what their problem was before, what they were struggling with, and that kind of illustrates it for us. Other questions? Yes. Uh, an observation. Yes, when please. You, when we talked about um, elevator speech and yeah. methodology and mm -hmm. structure, okay. so it very much reminded me of the uh, you know, way the company videos are structured because we just Oh, exactly. Of, exactly. Have, yeah, the same structure. Your, your company video is your elevator pitch only done in either animation or, or, or images, exactly that. I write a lot of scripts for production, for, for product films. I work with a great animator that then brings them to life and it's almost like he can see inside my brain and see what I, but we write the problem, mm -hmm. which has to be like about 20 seconds. The solution, which is like a demo that takes up about, I'd say, <coughs> you know, maybe 30 seconds and then just like some kind of closing and some kind of call to action so it shouldn't be longer than a minute. There you go. Sure. You suggest basically to take your elevator speech and you know, turn it into Absolutely, uh, if you can, and you can do like some very cheap options of videos nowadays. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. There's a lot of very inexpensive ways to do that. Good observation. Other questions or observations? Yes. What to wear, what not to wear. <laughs> so you do want the wear after all. Okay, Silicon Valley, as you might have noticed, is quite casual. Uh, my husband, since we moved here, feels like he found his tribe because everybody's walking around in hoodies and, and sneakers and jeans all the time. Um, I always say, if you're giving a big presentation or an important meeting, dress one degree up from what you normally would. Engineers can wear whatever the heck they want because they're expected to roll out of their bed after coding for 12 hours straight and just throw on something. So just be a Mark Zuckerberg and have a bunch of gray t-shirts. Um, for women, usually, I think if we were to walk into a meeting wearing jeans and, and sneakers, it would not have the same. Unfortunately, there's still a double standard there. So I think pretty much everybody's dressed for here for what they would wear to a meeting. Are you an engineer? Are you on the technical side? So you look, you have like the financial look. You know, if you go to Apple and, and sit around, you could get the guys with like the, the plaid button down shirts and the nice jeans, those are all the finance guys. And then the engineers are the ones with the hoodies. Like you can start to pick out of that. But I think all of you, I don't see anyone that's not dressed to impress. By the way, if you're wearing your company t-shirt, you might want to put a jacket over it just to class it up slightly. Other questions? Yes. Um, sometimes when I present or even I have a conversation, I uh, feel that my um, I'm trying to speak a very proper English. And Don't. Let go of that. Americans will never speak a second language as well as, as you speak English. <laughs> and they know it. So they're not sitting there judging your grammar or judging your English. They're just like, wow, you know, I'm understanding this person. This is great. And they will never correct you, unlike Israelis who will correct your grammar or in, in the middle of, you know, I lived in Israel for, for um, a long time on and off. And, and I'd give workshops there in Hebrew and I'd make a mistake and like there'd be a chorus of three people correcting and it totally throws you. So, but they'll never do that. Written is a different story. If you make grammar mistakes or uh, spelling mistakes, your credibility will be lost. So make sure you spell check, grammar check, have somebody check over it. Even myself, who writing is what I do, I, I release the blog and then somebody's like, hey, you wrote the instead of they in the first one. Ah! That's the beauty of medium. You can fix it on the spot. So it, it's like you, we can't see it anymore. Other questions? Cool. Um, so one last thing I want to do before I go, because we're about to hear 
some pitches and some elevator pitches. And any of you that want to kind of get up and try it, we have an hour now. We're going to hear from three startups and then anyone that wants to spontaneously pop up and do an elevator pitch based on the problem solution equation. So I'm going to do my elevator pitch now. So I'd like to ask you guys, all the entrepreneurs sitting in the room, how many of you have a one pager or a send out deck that you send out to investors? Raise your hand. Okay. How many hours did it take you to get to that point? A lot, right? Yeah, so I hear, if it's finished, right? So I hear anywhere between 40 and 400 hours, which is insane. Now, how many of you are happy after all those hours with the product that you have produced? Okay, good. So two, good. There are three, two, two and a half. Uh, so if somebody knocked on your door and said, here's a gift, 400 hours of your time back, what could you do with those 400 hours? So usually people will call me up and be like, hi, I've got 37 versions of my pitch deck and it's not very good. Can you help me? And they'll come over and in two hours they'll walk out with a great pitch deck. But I can't be everywhere all the time. So we created Invisu. Invisu is a wizard that guides you through the process of creating your send out deck in a very visual manner. You can put in rich media. You've got pictures and social links and videos and we help you create graphs and we help you answer some very challenging questions that investors want to hear. And then when you send it out, each person you send it to gets a unique link and you get to track and see who opened it, how much they read, what they looked at, how long they spent, how many times they've looked back and is this someone you should follow up with. So this is a special code for all of you um, in visu.me slash ambar. Uh, gives you an extended free trial and you're welcome to use it. I would love uh, for SVOD to use it instead of the 150 meg file that you had last year of the one pagers. We'll create you a lovely um, dashboard for it. That'll be our gift to you. Um, and that's about it. So, a lot of ways to stay in touch. Uh, you can ask to join my newsletter. I, I send out blogs that help you with the pitches. I don't spam you too much, or you can just follow my Facebook page. They're there as well, and I will send these slides out. Um, well, uh, okay, um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So we have three startups. Why don't we take a five-minute bio break? Uh, really quick, just go use the restroom. Just breathe a little bit, whatever you got to do, and come back, and we're going to hear from some teams and decide if you want to also get up there.